uh, this is concerning the law and the new covenant and uh, the law written in our heart. And God dealt with me uh, strongly this morning. I went to the church early and he dealt with me strongly about this. I'd planned something else, but you know, it's not my message. It's not my responsibility to decide what is preached. My responsibility is to obey him. And so we're going to learn some things, and I'll say some things you've probably never heard this morning, but you need to hear them and listen to them, and then let God work in us and through us to write his law in our heart. Very important. So thank you, Pastor. She is my healing pastor uh, here at Healing School, and I'm here to serve. And she asked me last night, she said, would you minister in the morning? I said, I'm here to serve you. If that's what you feel is in order and right in the Lord, I'm here to serve your vision in this school. And I like being the usher, but I don't mind preaching. I don't. Don't mind preaching at all. And, I, and you can ask those that were in Bible college. I preached hard last night. Man, I gave it everything I had for a couple hours. We went at it hard. We didn't get out of there until almost 10 o'clock. We went at it hard. And we learned and we grew. But God's a good God, and we're going to learn and grow today in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's good to see you, and I bless you. So let me start by blessing you. You are the blessed seed of Abraham. We which are of faith are the children of Abraham, Galatians 3, 7. Galatians 3, 9, we which are of faith are blessed. We're not trying to get blessed. We are blessed with faithful Abraham. And then Galatians 3, 13 and 14, some of my very favorite scripture. I say this continually all the time. Christ has redeemed us. So he redeemed me from the curse. All the curse. The entirety of the curse. The spiritual curse. The mental curse. The physical curse, the social curse, and the financial curse, the eternal curse, I'm redeemed from the curse of the law, being made a curse for me, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through faith, and we might receive the promise of the Spirit. And Galatians 3.29 says, if you be Christ, and I am, I belong to Jesus, I'm bought with a price, I belong to Jesus, if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. And so what they were in the old covenant in their first birth, we have a far greater standing with God in our second birth. The Jew must be born again because his first birth is not enough. To Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, Jesus said, sir, you must be born from above and born again. And Nicodemus was highly qualified because he was a ruler of the Jews. And if any Jew was going to be able to obtain by their first birth, Nicodemus was certainly um, able to obtain, but Jesus rejected his first birth and said, sir, you must be born again. And then Paul comes along in Romans chapter two and says, now he's not a Jew that's a Jew outwardly. So you can't claim your first birth in the new covenant, but he is a Jew that's a Jew inwardly. And he said, this is not circumcision of the flesh made with man's hands, but it's circumcision of the heart made by the spirit of the living God. So you are the blessed seed of Abraham. And it's important to understand this. It's a very simple concept, but God made Abraham five promises in this life. Number one, perfect righteousness without the keeping of the law. Not without the law, but without the keeping of the law. Perfect righteousness without the keeping of the law. We're going to talk about that today. Number two, peace, rest, and liberty from the curse. He said, Abraham, fear not. Now just hear those words, fear not. There's nothing in this realm, there's nothing in this dimension, Abraham, for you to be afraid of. There's no need. He just says in Genesis 15, one, he says, fear not. There's no need to fear the weather, the wind. There's no need to fear sickness, disease. There's no need to fear. For God hath not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. And you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption, whereby you call God your father. Fear thou not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. And yea, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. So if those statements are true, and we know they are, then we have no reason to be afraid. And the only reason we fear is because we're doubting him. Fear is the result of doubt. Jesus says in Luke 12, 29, neither be of a doubtful mind. Then he says again in Luke 12, 32, fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It pleases God to give you the kingdom. And he's working in you to will and do his good pleasure. And his good pleasure is to give you the kingdom. So we have peace and rest and liberty from the curse because Christ redeemed us from the curse. The third promise he made to Abraham was a promise of protection and a revelation of the Lord is his shield. He says in Genesis 15, 1, I am your shield. And Psalms 5, 12 said, the Lord blesses the righteous. He encompasses him with favor like a shield. And Psalms 3, David decreed, thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. In Ephesians chapter 6, we take the shield of faith and lift it up, and it quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked. So I proclaim today that the Lord is my shield. 
The Lord God is the sun and shield. He gives grace and glory and no good thing does he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So the Lord God is my sun and shield. Thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, the glory and lifter of my head. And the glory of my head and the lifter of my head is, is, is God. And Jesus is my head. So he glorified my head and he lifted my head and he put my head in the heavens. I'm the body. And he's the head. So I have a shield today. I have supernatural protection around me. And Psalms 512 said that is favor. So I'm surrounded with favor like a shield. And favor has three definitions. Number one is to exalt one above another. And so I'm exalted above my enemies. My enemies are under my feet. And Romans 16, 20 tells me that God wants to bruise Satan under my feet, to bruise him. Not that he just be under my feet, but to bruise Satan under your feet. And the God of peace bruised Satan under your feet shortly. As you learn to walk this way, Satan's not only under your feet, but being bruised under your feet. For Jesus said in Luke 10, 19, I give you power to tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. And here's your shield, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. The only thing wrong with that statement is we've yet to believe it. You come to church and preachers tell you all the time, well, you know, you're going to get hurt. You're going to get run over. You're going to get, you know, you're going to. Well, Jesus said nothing shall by any means hurt you. And so that's where God comes in as our shield. We're exalted above our enemies. Our enemies are under our feet. Number two, favor is an expression. Look at that boy. Oh, Lord, he expresses his father. If you've seen him, you've seen his father. He walked. Walk just like his daddy, looks like his daddy. Well, you talking to him, it's hard to tell him apart. Expression. Your favor is in God expressing himself, and you God living in you, God expressing. That's favor when God starts expressing himself because he thinks, believes, walks, and talks like no one else. He walks in a room where the little girl is dead, and he laughs and says, she's not dead. And they all said, we know she is dead, and he says, she's not dead. Who else thinks like that? Who taught us she is not dead? She sleeps, and they laughed him to scorn. He put them out, and just a moment later, they saw she was just sleeping. He got her, got her up. Praise God. He's a good God. He got her up, and he said, see, I told you. That's expression. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And I love this about favor. The third definition of favor is our shield, is that God embraces us in our weakness. Every one of you in here have some weakness of flesh. You have some infirmity of flesh. All of us have it. In Romans chapter 6, Paul said, I write to you because of the infirmity of your flesh. In Romans 8, 26, the Holy Ghost takes hold with us against the infirmities of our flesh. We all have them one way or another. We have some place, something that's a weakness of flesh. And, and yet to embrace, look at that man walk. He's favoring his right leg. Look at that. He's favoring. See, he's embracing. He's not cutting his leg off because it's weaker than his left leg. He's embracing. He's compensating. He's using a crutch. He's in a chair. He, he's favoring his right leg because God doesn't just cast you out because of your weakness. If he did, we'd all been cast out by now. We'd all be tossed by now. Thank God he's a good God. So he promised Abraham, listen, I will be your shield. So that's protection and a revelation of the Lord's shield. Then I love this in Genesis 15, 1. He promised him prosperity, riches, and liberality. Thank you for your rousing enthusiasm. He promised him prosperity, riches, and liberality. Abraham, I am thine exceeding great reward. And the word reward there means salary, means source, means supply. If you need it, that's what I am. And if you don't have it, I'll make it for you. That's what he said there. If you don't have it, I'll make it. If you need something and we don't have it, I'll just make it for you. I'm your source. I'm your supply. So thank God for spiritual, mental, physical, social, financial prosperity. Psalms 118.25, David prayed one of the great prayers of the Old Covenant, sin now salvation and sin now prosperity. There's some now prosperity God wants us to have, so send it now. Right now, while we're in the room, sin now prosperity. Sin now prosperity. And so then he becomes our prosperity, our riches, our liberality. How about scriptures like he daily loads us with benefits, Psalm 68.19. How about forget not all his benefits, Psalms 103. How about Romans 8, 32? He that spared not his own, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not also with him freely give us all things? How about 1 Corinthians 3, 21? All things are yours. 1 Timothy 6, 17, he gives us richly all things to enjoy. 2 Peter 1, 3, according as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. James 1, 17, every good, perfect gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there's neither variableness, neither shadow of turning. Consider the raven. They don't sow, reap, or store in a barn, but Father feeds them. Consider the lily. They don't toil or spend, but not even Solomon in the palace was arrayed in all of his glory like one of these lilies. And if God so feed the raven and clothe the lily, will he not much more 
Will he not much more, much more feed and clothe you, oh, you of little faith? We are blessed today. God's my source, my supply. He's my salary. I am richly blessed today. We are richly blessed today. Thank God we are richly blessed daily, continually. And then he promised him in Genesis 15, 15, the fifth promise was this. He promised him, he said, preservation, rejuvenation, and length of days and long life. He said, you will go to your fathers in a good old age. See, he put good on there so you'd repent about being old. Because most people dread getting old. They'll say things like getting old ain't for whims. Getting old ain't easy. And I'm sure, you know, it's not. I mean, I'm, I'm a grandfather. I've got this far. And I'm sure that as we go, we grow. But, but I do know this. There's a man in the Bible named Caleb. And Caleb said, Caleb said, the Lord has kept me alive. And this day my strength as it was when I'm 40. So I latched on to that. And every day I live, I just lift my hands to God and say, you have kept me alive. And today my strength is as now as it was when I was 40. And I'm not going to let go of that. Now, somebody said, well, in 20 years, you'll change your message. You may do that, but I won't change his because his is my message. See, he's not going to change his message for me or you or anybody else. So I'm going to be a Caleb in my generation. That's my passionate desire to be 85, still preaching, still traveling, still doing everything I'm doing. And I plan to give the open door to somebody else when I'm 85 and go on the field. That's my plan. I'm going on to the pool. I'll still be part of the Bible college, part of the church, but I'm going on the field. So praise God. And I got 25 years to believe God for that to be so. He promised you length of days, long life, and peace. See, people say, well, you're going to be older in 10 years, but you don't think like that. You think like this. I got 10 years. I got that many days. I got, what would that be, 36, 5, 36, 100 days plus. I got that long, that long to believe God. Every day I can believe God for more of this to work in my body. See, if we would just realize time is our great asset if we'd use it rightly. Time is a great weapon if you use it wisely. Oh, praise God. Well, I'm just talking to you as, as would a father. So five blessings, perfect righteousness without the keeping of the law, peace, rest, liberty from the curse, protection, the revelation of the Lord is a shield, prosperity, riches, and liberality. Number five, preservation, rejuvenation, good old age, and you'll go to your fathers in peace and shalom and be buried. And he said, shalom there, peace is shalom. So I'm going, and he didn't say, that means that I'm not going blind not going deaf i'm not going with uh you know my limbs taken off like we've all seen people do good godly people we're not going that way we're going in shalom that doesn't mean you're just going to lay and die a peaceful death that means you're going whole well how are we going to die then we're going to die by faith if the time comes when it's time to go home we should put our body off by faith peter said this is my temple and god has showed me i must shortly put off this my tabernacle it's my responsibility and God told me years ago he said if you'll live on my terms I'll let you come home on your terms so I want to come home and, and if the time comes and I believe to be alive and remain at the coming of the Lord but should the time come that I decide to go home and want to go home and he satisfied me with long life and I've seen what I need to see and I will go empty I just bow before God with his help by his grace by his spirit by the blood by the word of God I will not take one thing with me you want to make sure you leave here empty don't take one thing if you got a song, it needs to be sung. If you got a word, it needs to be given. If you got something to write, write it down. Don't leave anything to take with you. Just, just empty all out. You live full, but die empty. Why? Because that's the richest place in the whole town is in the cemetery. Because there's lots of things that should have been said, spoken, should have been written, should have been sung that never were because people took it to the grave. How sad that Elisha took an anointing to the grave that would raise a man from the dead when he should have given it to the king in 2 Kings 13, and it should have been passed from generation to generation. But right there, when Elisha the prophet took that anointing to the grave, preachers have touted that as some great deal. That was just a disgrace because from that point on, prophets had no power in Israel. They only had prophetic word. Thousand years, what Elisha did there, taking his anointing to the grave, cut pro pro prophetic power off from the prophets for a thousand years. You don't take anything to the grave. And you know he's talking about your body. He said you shall be buried. You don't bury a man's spirit. You don't bury a man's soul. You bury his body. You shall be buried in a good old age. So we're blessed. You're the blessed seed of Abraham. Amen. Now what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? That's the question. What are we going to do about it? Now I'm going to take this first one. Now he promised him a perfect righteousness without the keeping of the law. So let's read here in Isaiah 42 and then to Hebrews. And I'll just follow the Holy Ghost as best I can. 
I didn't bring notes, just my heart. So we'll see what the Lord has and we'll go from here. So Isaiah 42, 21, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Yodvad Elohim, Yodvad Yara, Jehovah Jireh, Nisi, Sid, Kenu, Shema, Reah, Shalom, Raphael, Shaddai, all of that, the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. So this is good news. He's well pleased. And his righteousness sake or his namesake is Jesus. So because of Jesus, he's well pleased. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So he's well pleased for Jesus' sake. Who Jesus is, what he's done, what that means to us, has pleased the Father. Now, you'll notice there, the writers and the translators put that punctuation mark there. That's the end of that thought. Now, we know that the words are inspired. The punctuation was left up to the people. And they did that in order to accommodate what's called syntax. And syntax is just a word that just means they had to work the language. See, this was translated from Hebrew into English. And so they didn't just do things at their will arbitrarily. Well, I think a comma ought to go there. Or that's the end of that. They couldn't do that. They had to make the structure of the sentences work. So a lot of people have taught us in church, well, you know, like the italicized words or the punctuation marks, we should just ignore them. No, you shouldn't. It's not wise to do that because they weren't put there at the arbitrary thought of some man in the 1600s. They were put there because of the demand of the language. There's a demand in the language. For example, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who what? Walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That's italicized. Now, why did they put that there? See, somebody said, well, they didn't have a right to do that. Well, if you'll read one through four, he says, they that walk after the flesh, they that walk after the spirit. You see, it was in the context and the syntax of the Greek writing of that. Paul wrote that in Greek that he understood and the writers and the, and the translators understood that in order to keep thoughts of what he really said in Romans chapter eight, one through four is this. There's no condemnation. You're a building. You're a temple. There's no condemnation. That means there's nothing in you condemned now. See, if something's condemned as a building, you can't inhabit it. So God's saying, now I've got the condemnation sign off you, and now I can inhabit all of you. And in order for me to inhabit and, and inhabit and fill all of you, you need to learn to walk in the Spirit. Because if you walk in the flesh, you're hindering me from operating in certain places in your life and filling you the way I want to. See, that's why that's in there. There's no condemnation. I'm a, I'm a building. I'm the temple of God. There is a no vacancy sign on me, but there's a the no condemnation sign has been put on me, but condemnation has been taken off. See, now, because of that word, and that's why they put that there, not just to fill up space, not just to add bondage to the people, but they put it there for you to see that as you learn to walk in the Spirit, you're opening yourself up to God, and He'll fill every place in you, that your mind, your mouth, your morals, money, motive, whatever it is, He can fill all of you because you're the temple, and you belong to Him, bought with a price. You're His. You're bought with a price. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit with your God. So, uh, this thought was the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. And they put that there to say, now God has let Jesus come and finish the work. It's done. Thank God he's well pleased. Now from that well pleasing, from that position of what he has done, he will magnify the law, not without being well pleased. He will magnify. He will bring forth the law. And that's the Ten Commandments and make it honorable. See that make it honorable. Uh, that word in the Hebrew is a dar, it to great, to be great, noble, majestic, to be powerful, to be prophetic. It means to be glorious. He will make the law glorious and make it honorable. And then without changing thoughts, but, you know, that's a conjunction, but this is a people. You see, this is a people who are under the Lord being well pleased, and yet he's magnified the law, but this people. And this is tragic the way this is written. This is a people robbed and spoiled. And in church, well, we've been robbed. Some of the greatest robberies that ever happened happened right out in the parking lot. There's a thief waiting out there. A lot of times he don't even wait out there. He comes on in here with some people. They invite him on in. Mm -hmm. They've been robbed. Spoiled means to keep an immaturity. They've been robbed. The thief cometh not before to steal, kill, and destroy. And we add that with, and Satan cometh what? Immediately to take away the word that was so, so he's coming after what's been sown in your heart, not just the word. I mean, he's not trying to get the Bible out of your hand. He's only because the Bible on the page ain't helping you a whole lot. It's good. It's pretty. And it's there. But he comes after the word that was sown in their heart. See, because he knows if he get that in your heart, then it's going to manifest and do something that's going to change his world and make you a victor and not not a victim. 
So they're robbed and spoiled. And, and we've been kept immature too long. It's time to grow up into Christ. We've been hearing that for years. We grow up in him in all things. And so then he goes a little further. And he says, now they're robbed and spoiled. This people got, we're under the finished work. God's magnified the law in the new covenant. But this people spoiled and robbed. They're all of them snared in holes. And to be snared, you recover yourself from the snare of the fowler in Psalms 91. But in 2 Timothy 2.26, it's the snare of the devil, the accuser. The accuser. That they may recover themselves from the snare of the devil that are taken captive at his will. Hmm. The, so they're snared, and, and you're an eagle, not a turkey, not a chicken. You're an eagle. And unfortunately, these snares keep the eagles with the turkeys and the chicken. Yeah. Well, meddling right along. And they are hid in prison and houses. They're for a prey, and none delivers. And we've seen very little deliverance. We see a lot of good church people coming week in, week out with bondage, and none delivers for a spoil, and none says restore. So God steps in and says, now I'm going to say restore. It's in Joel 2.25. I will restore unto you the years that the palmer worm, the locust, the canker worm, and the caterpillar have eaten away. And your years are in your seed. God's not going to give you the time back in this dimension. He'll give you back your seed of harvest. Everything you've sown in the kingdom is yours. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. What a man sows, that shall he. So every seed I've sown, I don't have the manifestation or harvest of it, but I call my seed to harvest. For God says in Deuteronomy 30, 19, your seed shall live. Every prayer, every seed, every dime, everything from Bibles to Buicks that we've all sown and given away. Some of us have given cars. Yeah, I gave Bibles. I gave a Buick away. I gave a nice Buick away. Bibles to Buicks, everything in between. He said, you and your seed shall live. I call my harvest today. My harvest, I call it into manifestation. And he said, God says, restore. So nobody else is preaching it, but God says, restore. And God is going to restore the years, and your time is in your seed. All this investment since 1979 for me, all this investment in the kingdom is not, I can't get that time back, but I can get the seed that's out there. It may be dead, it may be dormant, but God can make those seeds live. And when that seed comes, I'll be one of the richest men on planet earth in every realm because I've sown and sown and sown and sown and sown and every, I've sown spiritually and mentally and physically and socially and financially. So my time, my talent, my treasures, I've sown my temple, I've given, I've labored, I've served. If that comes in, man, blessing of Abraham, come on the Gentiles. See, that's how that's going to happen and it's happening. Praise God. So he's going to magnify the law. So again, we notice what Jesus has done, and he's going to magnify the law. Does everybody see that? And make it honorable. As long as we try to keep it, and we cut one another with it, and we attack one another with the law, it's not honorable. But now today, the law is in an honorable place. So now with that in mind, go to Hebrews chapter 8 quickly. Because we'll be here all day if I don't get my text read. We've got to get preaching here in a minute. <laughs> not preaching yet, we're just talking. Hebrews chapter 8. All right, Hebrews chapter 8. Very important. Now, remember what we just read. It's very important because this is where the grace teachers have stopped and they've not taken us this far and it's time to go forward now. It's time to go forward. All right, so he says here in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, but now, see, in, we just read in Isaiah, God will, but now, now we're moved into now, the new covenant's now. The new covenant is not later, it's now. Now faith is, and without faith we have no new covenant. Now, Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is a mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. So thank God I'm in the new covenant, new mediator, not Moses, but Jesus, a greater than Moses is here. Thank God we have a better covenant. It's established on better promises. If the first covenant had been faultless, then there should have been no place sought for the second. Finding fault with them. So God didn't find fault with his word. He found fault with them. Get that. See, there's nothing wrong with what God said. How do you know that? Well, because God said it. If it was something wrong with it, he wouldn't have said it. This is easy. This, I mean, this is, this is kindergarten stuff here. If God said it, it has to be right. How do you know? The word of the Lord is right. All his works are done in truth. If he said it, it's right. It can't be wrong because when it came out of his mouth, it was made right. We rejoice. So finding fault with them. Listen to the mercy and grace here. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord. I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And you know the gospel is to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. So here... God's not making two covenants, one with the Jew and one with the Gentile. He's making one new covenant with both. 
On the cross, he made Jew and Gentile one. He's making one new covenant. Not according to the covenant I made with the fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. And notice that was before the law was given. They were under Abraham's blessing there because they continued not in my covenant. Why? Because they stopped and they asked for the law there in Exodus chapter 20. You find that in chapter 19 and 20. And I regarded them not, saith the Lord. This is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind. Now, see, he's about to magnify the law because when you go in most churches, it's over here hanging on the wall. We got a copy of the Ten Commandments and everybody has to go look at it and read it. Now, he's going to magnify the law. He's going to make it much bigger. He's going to take it from off the wall and he's going to put it in our hearts. He's going to write it in our hearts. He's going to magnify the law. It's going to be much bigger than it ever was before. It's just so much rich truth here. He said, I will put my laws in their mind and in their hearts will I write them. I will be to them a God. They will be my people. They shall not teach every man his neighbor, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. All shall know me in this kingdom, in this new covenant, from the least to the greatest. We'll all know. You can know God for yourself. Now you can have a relationship with God for yourself. From the least to the greatest. Listen to this. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Boy, that's good news. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. In the old covenant, your sins will be visited to the children's, 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 to four generations. In the new covenant, I remember them no more. Where are the sins of the people today? On the tree. Behold the Lamb of God which took your sin. If it's on the tree, it's not on me. If it went to the grave, I don't have to be a slave. I wish you'd help me preach this morning. And in that God said a new covenant, he made the first old. So the moment he said, I'm going to make a new covenant, that was way back in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. I'm going to make a new covenant. The old became old the moment he said new. Now, that which is decaying and wax old is ready to vanish away. This was written in 67 A.D. There about 70 A.D. God was going to finish the old covenant. When Titus, the Roman general, comes in, he wipes out Jerusalem, destroys their sacrificial system, and took their temple and dismantled it. Not one stone was left on another. He's about to finish their system. You do realize that system's been finished. And you do know that even if they build a temple, God ain't going back to animal sacrifices. You do know that. Some actually preach and believe that in, the, in what they call the millennial reign, there'll be animal sacrifices. If God ever does that, he's got something splaining to do. You, you remember what Ricky used to say to Lucy, something needs splaining here? You remember that? <laughs> Lucy, something needs splaining. You remember that? Well, God will have some explaining to do because he said the final sacrifice has been offered. Forgive me, but I believe in the blood of Jesus. Forgive me, but for me, that's it. The final sacrifice has been offered, and the Lamb of God forever has offered His blood. It has been shed, sprinkled, and it speaks. The Lord is well pleased for His righteousness' sake. And if He's well pleased, I'm well pleased. If He's well pleased, I am well pleased. Then one more scripture, Hebrews chapter 10. Same thought again, Hebrews 10. God's going to say this to us twice. So you've got to understand this. He didn't write one law in the Old Covenant and another in the New, but he, and I'm going to show you the difference and show you how this works. So we'll, for time's sake, we'll go to Hebrews chapter 10, 12. This man, Jesus, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So Jesus offered one sacrifice, his blood, sat down forever. And from henceforth, he's expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. And we were enemies, and we were reconciled to God, and now I'm his footstool because his walk rests in me. See, the earth is his footstool. Where's his feet? His feet are in the earth. Where are they? They're in you. He wants to walk this through you. See that? By one offering, him crucified, he, Jesus, perfected forever. That's me. He perfected forever them that are sanctified. I'm set apart, so I'm perfected forever. This offering was so pure, so perfect. Notice this, very important, that forever is the quantity of it. It's how much there is. That's how long it lasts. And then perfected is the quality of it. Both quality and quantity. Perfected is the quality. Forever is the quantity. See that? The offering of Christ, so perfect and pure. Now notice this. The Holy Ghost is a witness. So God sent the Holy Ghost to witness. As he has said before. And so God always says again what he said before. He doesn't have to repeat himself, but he's just enforcing it to us. This is the covenant I'll make with him after those days, saith the Lord. I put my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. What is this new and living way? That God now has taken the law 
And he's taken it from our, our head and from our hands and put it in our heart. By this way of this blood, this sacrifice and what he's doing with the law, now he's making the law honorable and making a new living way that you can come boldly to the throne of grace by the blood. Now, now this is very important and I'll be quick on this part. When you go back to Genesis 1, 2, 3, you do not find God giving man the Ten Commandments. He did not say, Adam, you'll have no other gods before me. Adam, you'll not make or bow down to any graven image. Adam, you'll remember my name and keep it holy. Keep the Sabbath day. You've got to have church in this garden once a week. Remember that now. <laughs> he didn't tell him to rest because he put him at rest. Oh, there's so much here. He didn't say, now you shall not kill. You shall not steal. You shall not commit adultery. I mean, who's Adam going to commit adultery with? I mean, his choices are very limited on that. You got one woman, you got one man. It's pretty obvious that, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not bear false witness. So you don't find it in Genesis. So you know this wasn't God's intended plan. God's intended plan was given in the book of Genesis. And then when the man fell, God only used the word curse on the serpent. He said, because you've done this, you're cursed. The curse was only put on the serpent. But see, we've never heard that preached in church because we're always talking about how we're cursed and God cursed the serpent. I read it again this morning just to make sure that I wasn't coming up with some new doctrine. But God <laughs> cursed the serpent. And then he told the man and the woman, he said, because of what you've done, this will be the confusion you'll have. And their confusion manifested in two ways. For the woman, in, in great sorrow, you will bring forth children. When bringing forth a child should be the greatest joy, he said, now it will be sorrow. See, that's confusion. That's the result of the curses. Confusion came on us. And Adam, when you sow seed and reap your harvest, it will no longer be easy but by your sweat, and it will be thorns and nettles and briars. See, that's confusion because before he fell, he just spoke to the ground and it produced whatever he said because he was created in the image of God. And God rules the world and the universe with words and he put Adam in the garden to rule it with words. You will till and keep the ground. Adam didn't have a John Deere tractor. He didn't have a hoe. He didn't have a, he didn't have a shovel or a rake. He had words. God did things with words. If Adam wanted the garden to be tilled, all he had to do was speak words to it. It produced. He used words. So, boy, you learn a lot there. And then you go quickly on to the calling of Abraham. Abraham, in Genesis chapter 11 and 12, come to him and say, Now, Abraham, i got a deal for you, but here's the ten things I require of you. You can't have no other gods. You can't make or bow down to any graven images. And his family were all idolaters. He said, you've got to come out of that foolishness. And you can't take my name in vain. He didn't give that to Abraham. He said, you come and I will bless you. All I need you to do is follow. All I need you to do is give me something to work with. And he said, if you'll just give me something to work with, I'll bless you. He said, I'll make your name great. I'll bless you. I'll make you a, a blessing. And he was really talking to the seed, which was Jesus. He said, all I need is you to just cooperate with me. And if you'll cooperate, then I can greatly bless you. So Abraham came on out. And then when you go quickly to the children of Israel... And when God said, I want my people out of bondage, they're the seed of Abraham, I want them out. He didn't say, now Moses, here, you take these, this tablet of stone down there and tell them what I require. Moses didn't go down there with Ten Commandments, he went with seven promises. Now right here is a huge shift for the church. This is not about commandment, it's about promise first. He said, you go down there and tell them, I will rid them of their bondage. Number one. Number two, I'll rid them of their burden. Number three, I'll redeem them with an outstretched arm. Three promises. Number four, I'm going to be their God. Number five, they'll be my people. Number six, I'll bring them into the land. And number seven, they'll inherit it forever. Seven promises, not ten commandments. See, God wants you to receive the promise. He gave us exceeding great and promises. Exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partaker of the divine nature. Promises. And so you'll notice when they came out of Egypt, they murmured and God blessed. They murmured and God blessed. They murmured at the Red Sea. God split the sea. They murmured in the wilderness of sin. God sent manna. They murmured. They didn't have anything to drink. And God smote the rock, see, because they were under the covenant of Abraham. He was not imputing trespasses against them. But then God called Moses and said, tell them to keep the commandment. And the commandment was simply to circumcise the males on the eighth day. It was the cutting of the flesh because Abraham had been justified by faith, not by the keeping of any law, but by faith he had been justified. And that justification resulted in the cutting away of his flesh. And our justification results in the cutting away of our flesh. Can you see that? 
And they said, no, tell him whatever Moses, tell him whatever he commands us that we will do. And at that point, everything shifts. Now the law is given. The law was added for. Anybody? I got y'all so scared. You ain't going to say nothing. Never heard nothing like this in all my life. The law was added because of. What is it, Sarah? Transgression. And the transgression was only one. There's only one transgression in the old or the new. And that is unbelief. Even in the new covenant, he that believeth not shall be damned. He that believeth not is condemned already. He had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ and believes that God raised him from the dead and confesses with his mouth. Unbelief. The law was added because of their unbelief. If they had been wise there in Exodus 20, they would have said, listen, we'll just keep the covenant we have. We're the seed of Abraham and we will circumcise the eighth day as you have commanded and we will follow your voice. That's all God required of Abraham. Praise God. And so then the law came, and man, it was one more jumbled mess after that. Idolatry and groves. I mean, Moses goes up to get the law. He's up there for the 40 days in the presence of God. He's having church. He's having glory. He's going where no man's gone before. He comes back down, and there is Aaron and all the people, or at least most of the people there, dancing naked around a golden calf. They have made an idol. Now, you know, if I had an associate pastor... My elders, let's just say my elders, and I went away 40 days and I came back and opened the doors and they were dancing naked around the golden calf. We'd have problems. <laughs> and then he asked Aaron, who is responsible for this colossal mess. That's a mess. And he said, we just put our gold in the fire and the calf came out. He said, that's what the fire produced. No, that's what you produced. And God said, <laughs> Get out of my way. That did it. I'm finished. I've had it with these. Moses said, no, because then they'll say in Egypt, you brought us out here to slay us. You're a God. Have mercy on them. And Moses stood as the mediator of an old covenant, and he had power with God in intercession. And how much more does Jesus have power of the intercession? Romans 8, 34, Hebrews 7, 25. He ever liveth to make intercession. How much more? And you follow that line all the way through the old covenant. You get to Malachi. And Malachi, Malachi 3.13, God says, your words have been stout against me. You've said again and again, there's no profit in serving God. You've said again and again, there's no joyfulness in serving God. You're, all the way through the old covenant, it came down to your words are stout against me. So then God sent his righteousness sake, Jesus, to fix the problem. And Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. And the law hangs on Two commandments. Do you know what they are? You will love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul, and your, your neighbor as yourself. That hangs all the law and the prophets. Well, I've been in church where they taught me. Now, this, we don't have to keep the ten, just the two. And the two are just as much law as the ten. Do you understand that? So Jesus then goes into the Garden of Gethsemane, and he fulfills the law there. He fulfilled the law in the Garden of Gethsemane. He got on his knees in the gritty gravel of that garden. And he prayed this prayer. And it is the fulfillment of that word. You will love God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. Your neighbors, yourself. He got on his knees in that gritty gravel of the garden. And he said, not my will but thine be done. And right there, he loved God with all his heart, mind, strength, and soul. Right here, he laid down what he was and took up what I was. Right here, he laid down his righteousness and took up my sin. Right here, he laid down his blessing and took up my curse. He laid down his peace and took up my fear. He laid down his divine life in his body and took up my sickness. He laid down his perfect harmony with the Father and took up my separation and my estrangement for the Father. And he loved God with all his heart, mind, strength, and soul. He says, not my will, but thine be done. And he loved me there as much as a man could love me because he gave everything for me there. He loved God with all his heart, mind, strength, and soul. His neighbors himself and he fulfilled the law right there. And that's where God was pleased. That's where God was pleased right there. That's what pleased God. Not my will, but thine be done. And then Jesus went to the cross after drinking the cup and paid for every transgression against the law. Every transgression against the law was paid for. All of us, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, there's none righteous, no, not one. Who decided that? The law did. 
And the law hath concluded all under sin that all may appear guilty before God and the mouth of every man may be shut. When you stand in the light of the law and you look at the law, there's not one of us can say, I've always had you as my God. I never bowed to an image. I never lied. I never stole. I never cheated. I never committed adultery in my heart. Whatever it is. I mean, I don't care about what it is. Whatever it is. Doesn't matter. None of us can say your mouth is shut. If you see the law, that shuts your mouth. I am a sinner. I need a Savior. And that's what the law was designed to do, was to bring you to Christ and cause you to be justified by faith. The law is a schoolmaster. And thank God it's done its job. I really, I needed a Savior. And I'll be honest, I need Him right now as much as I needed Him then. I was a 17-year-old arrogant punk kid that just needed a Savior. And right now, I need Jesus more than I've ever needed Him. I need a Savior. I need righteousness. I need strength. I need wisdom. I need understanding. I need His holiness. I need His power. I need His spirit. I need His glory. I need Jesus. Forgive me, but I'm one of those very needy people. I need Jesus. I have read, I am the vine and you are the branch. Without me, you can do nothing. Our sufficiency is not of ourself. Our sufficiency is of God. Oh, I need a Savior. And he died on that tree and he died to, to deal with every transgression Jew or Gentile would ever make against the law. And some would argue we were never under the law, but yet Romans tells you plainly, all men are concluded under the law and the law concluded all under sin and there's none righteous, no, not one, and uh, none good, no, not one, and the wages of sin is death. And you go through the Roman road and it condemns us and he died on that tree and he died on that cross. And so then the handwriting of ordinances Colossians 2, that was contrary to us, was taken out of the way and nailed to his. Everything that was ever written against me was taken out of the way and it was nailed to his cross. Thank God. Everything that was ever written against me was nailed to his cross. And Jesus died and he was separated. And he bore the separation the law produced. Your sin separated you from God. He was laid in the lowest pit, but three days and three nights later, God raised him from the dead. Let's shout this morning. It ain't Easter Sunday, but he lives. He's alive. Jesus is alive. He raised from the dead. He entered in with his own blood, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. He perfected forever them that are sanctified. He offered one sacrifice for sins. It is finished. It is done. And God says, I am well pleased for my righteousness sake. Jesus did enough. Let's go further. He didn't do it enough he did too much he didn't just save me he completely saved me he didn't just heal me he provided healing for the world he didn't just deliver me he divide, provided deliverance for the world he did enough he did too much Jesus did enough praise God and that blood from that mercy seat night day day night calls and speaks better things than that of Abel it speaks better things now has come salvation and strength the kingdom of our God the power of his Christ and the accuser of the brethren is cast down which did accuse our brethren day and night before our God right now in this moment that blood is speaking to every man every woman every boy every girl all planet earth the blood speaks and it is our redemption and he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified by one offering just one by one offering just by one it's enough but now God says, now the new covenant's in place. See, Jesus is in place. He's Lord of the new covenant. He's the head. Now, he said, now the Holy Ghost has been sent. And we get born again and we get filled with the Spirit. Now, he says, now what I want to do is take the law that's been over your head. And I want to take it and I want to take it out of your hands. And I want to write it in your heart. You see, because this is the new covenant. And the reason the people there in Isaiah 42 got prophesied of the new covenant people being spoiled and robbed, snared by the snare of the fowler, snared by the accusations and condemnation is because they still have a law over their head and in their hands instead of in their heart. And so this result of robbery and spoiling and snaring and all that went on in Isaiah 42, 22 is the direct result of the law being over your head or the law being in your hand or the law not being written in your heart. And see, this is where grace teachers have miserably failed because they've not taken the step to teach us that the law must be written in our heart. And I've listened to them all and I've listened to them a lot, but I've not heard one, I mean not one, say, but what did God say? This is the new covenant. Now, are we new covenant people or not? This is the new covenant, saith the Lord. I will write my laws. So, first of all, he's got to take it from over my head. So let's, let's get that straight real quick. Now, first thing we need to do is know who our head is. Most folk don't know where their head is and who their head is. 
If you don't know where your head is and who your head is, you've got big problems. My head is Jesus. In the Old Covenant, you'll be the head, not the tail. That's Old Covenant. In the New Covenant, He's the head, I'm the body. The good news is, I can never be the head of anything, but I'll never be the tail of anything either. It's good news. I'm not the head. He's the head. God gave Him head over all things. Ephesians chapter 1. He's the head. So I can't be head of anything, but I'm the body, so I won't be the tail ever again. Okay? So now, when you go to the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 10, the Bible said, in the ark, the covenant in Jesus, there remains one thing. To this day, he said, there's only one thing, and that's the unbroken law. 2 Chronicles 5, 10. The golden pot of manna was taken out. Aaron's rod that budded was taken out. And now there's 2 Chronicles 5, 10, so you can look at it yourself. There's only one thing there, and that's the unbroken law. So that is a picture. In Christ, there is an unbroken law. And so now I am seated in Christ. And when we're seated in that mercy seat, then that mercy seat was above the Ark of the Covenant. See, I'm seated with him. And so under my feet is the law. And you see a picture of that in Revelation chapter 12. The woman had the moon under her feet. And the moon is always a type of the law because it's the lesser light to rule the night. And the law is not for a righteous man, but an unrighteous man. Unholy, unthankful, liar, whoremonger, fornicator, adulterer. He goes on and on and on and on and talks there about men slayers and manslayers and those that are evil and godly in First Timothy chapter 1. And so the moon has no light of its own. It only can reflect the light of the sun. So then this woman that John sees in Revelation chapter 12, she's got the moon under her feet or she's got something established. See, when I'm seated in Christ, that law it becomes my foundation because let's shout this morning, the righteousness of the law has been fulfilled in us. Romans chapter 8. He said that the righteousness of the law, as much as he loved God, as much as he loved me, that love that fulfilled the law is now fulfilled in me because the love of God is shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost which is given unto me. Wow. Wow, man, that's powerful. That's powerful. So now, in order for people to operate in the law, in the book of Samuel, what they did when, when the Philistines got the Ark of the Covenant, look what happened. Uh, they, they wanted to see inside it, so they had to push the mercy seat back. They had to push the blood that had been sprinkled of the bull and goat there. They had to push it out of the way. And when they looked into the law, pushing mercy out of the way. And, and that's when we, we were determined to hold on to the law and we pushed mercy out of the way. We pushed the mercy seat out of the way and we look into the law. 50,000 people died when they pushed mercy aside and looked in the law. And the church, no wonder Paul writes and said, the letter kills but the spirit gives life. And any time I'm willing to, to look at Pastor Steve or Pastor Bear, any of you, and I'm willing to push mercy aside, Regardless of where I've been or what I've done or what I've said, God's mercy is there because there's blood there. And if there's blood there, there's mercy. For the vilest, the most ungodly, unholy sinner, there is blood there. No matter what you've done or haven't done, that blood is greater than your sin. You cannot out sin His blood. His blood is greater than your sin, your condemnation, your guilt, or your shame. His blood is greater. And 50,000 men died. By doing that. So the law is no longer over my head. Now it's under my feet. But I'm not to trample on it. Because he said you'll trample on serpents and scorpions. Hmm. Not stones. But he does say if you dash your foot against a stone in Psalms 91. See the stone is the law. And, and a lot of people trip over the law. But he sends angels, messengers to help you and lift you above. You're tripping over the law. If you just listen to me before we leave this morning, this will get you over the law. This will get you out from under condemnation. The law is not over your head. Your head is Christ. And Jesus has the perfect law fulfilled in Him. And you're in Christ. And you're seated. And His righteousness of that law and that keeping of that law is now your foundation. You stand in a place where the law now, thank God, is under your feet with reverence and respect. And it is now a foundation for you because He's writing the law in your heart. Isn't that good news? I praise God. That's good news. And then, of course, we in the church, the way I was raised, they put the law back in your hands. Now, when it's in your hands, when it's over your head, it's a demand. It demands something of you. It demands a righteousness you can never produce, a holiness you can never keep. And now it's in my hands, it demands a performance. This is what I must do. This is what I must do. This is what I must do. And the new covenant is not about the doing, it's about the believing. The believing produces the doing. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not the power of God to them that behave, but them that believe. 
And believing produces behavior. I'm not excusing bad behavior, but believing will produce behavior. The power of Jesus Christ is the gospel to them that believe, Romans 1.16. So now it's not in my hand anymore. He's taking it from my hands. And he begins to write the law in my heart. You see, I'm not under the demand of the law to supply righteousness for myself or keep the law. I'm now in a place where all I need to do is yield and be open and he can start writing the law in my heart. And see, I, I would dare say I doubt if any one of you have ever prayed for God to write the law in your heart. I dare say you've never prayed that prayer one time. And this is the new covenant I'll make with you in those days, saith the Lord. I, you want to be new covenant, but you never prayed one time for the beginning of the new covenant, the writing of the law in your heart. You see, this is why he said this is a people robbed and spoiled. I, I would dare say not one person in this room has ever prayed that. I have to confess Till just about six months ago, never prayed it myself either. Never one time. Never one time. But listen to it again. This is the covenant I will make with you in those days. I will write my law in your heart and in your mind. And you've never prayed one time for that. You never yielded to it. You never asked for it. You never desired. Not, not once. And you've been saved 10, 15, 20. Well, not once. And it's where he said, this is the new covenant. You can't misread that. This is the covenant I'll make with you in those days, saith the Lord. I'll write my law and then go back to Isaiah 42. What does he say? He says, now I'm well pleased for my righteousness. Say, he did enough. Oh, I'm well pleased. And he said, now we made the law honorable. It's not over my head anymore. It's not in my hands. Now he wants to write it in my heart and magnify it and get it off the wall and get it in my heart. And he said, but this is a people robbed and spoiled. Why? Because we've never allowed him to write the law in our heart. And grace took us far enough as to get it out from over our head and out of our hands. But then here you go and you watch and you start looking at what grace has produced. Not grace, but what grace teachers have produced. And we've been doing this now for about 15 years. And you see all this excessive sin and flesh and all these things coming out. Why? Because the next step of that message is for God to write the law in our heart. And you got a lot of people that disdain the law. They despise it. But listen to Psalms 119, 165. 119, 165. Great shalom have they that love thy law. Listen to it. Oh, man, this is powerful. Psalms 119, 165. Great shalom have they that love thy law. Nothing, are you listening? Nothing shall by any means offend them. See, the writing of this law in my heart gets me over offense. And you already know, offense is a big one in the body of Christ. The root of bitterness springing up any root, trouble you and defile you. And he says, nothing shall by any means offend them. And you got so many people that just disdain even the thought of the Ten Commandments. But oh God, how I love thy law. Write it in my heart. Write it in my heart. And I want to show you how he does this. Now I've been, I've been going, what is it? It's about... Oh, just a little bit after 12. Give me about 10 more minutes and I'll wrap this up. And this is just a, the speedboat across the top of the lake. There's a whole lot more here than this. Well, let's just start out. Let, let's, let's let God this morning. W would you do that? Would you just say, Lord, according to Hebrews 10 and verse 15 and Hebrews chapter 8, would you just, Lord, write your law in my heart today? Would you do that? I'm going to ask him right here. Father, would you write your law in my heart and inscribe it so deep? God, that write it in my heart. Oh, God, write it in my heart deeper than, than I've ever realized it could be in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right, it's the first time you ever prayed that prayer, right? Now you make that a daily prayer. And you do that daily. Now watch this. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, when that was said in that tone, it was said as a demand. It's like God's putting his, his, his hand down and saying, you will have no other gods before me. But now... It's not over my head and it's not in my hands anymore. It's written in my heart. And it sounds like this. Thou shall have no other gods before me. So what he's going to do when he inscribes that underneath that to give you the foundation for that, he's going to write to you and show you in your heart who he is and how great he is. Whew. He's going to say, I am the creator of all things. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. My name is I am that 
I am. I am Jehovah Jireh. I am Jehovah Nisi. I am Jehovah Sidkenu. I am your righteousness. I am your strength. I am your portion. I am your blessing. I am your rock. I am your revelation. I am your healer. I am your deliverance. I am your freedom. I am your life. I am the length of your days. I am your strength. And beside me there is no other. I am God. And there's nobody but me, saith the Lord. And he starts writing that in your heart. I am God and there is nobody but me. And then you realize the world has to have all these gods because they can't find one that's satisfied. They go to the tarot cards. They go to the tea leaves. They got to go to the palm reader. They got to go to the astrologer. They got to go to the Ouija board. They got to go to the horoscope. You know what's in your horoscope? Horror. That's what's in your horoscope. Why would you, why would you do something that dumb as look at the stars when there's one that made the stars? He'll offer you guidance. He'll show you where to go. He'll talk to you. He'll walk with you. He'll bless you. He'll keep you. He'll anoint you. He'll fill you. Oh, he writes in your heart. You are, and once you realize that that's written in your heart, you know what? You'll laugh because you'll say, well, I couldn't have another God if I wanted to because there's only one God anyhow. Amen. You see, to be God, you gotta have three characteristics. You got to, number one, you got to be omnipotent. You got to have all power. Number two, you got to have all knowledge. You got to be omniscient. You got to know past, present, and future. And then you got to be omnipresent. You got to be everywhere at one time. And ain't nobody on this side of eternity or that side of eternity except him that's got those three characteristics. Uh, David said, power belongeth unto God. David said that if I go into heaven, you're there. If I go to hell, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I go to the wings of the morning and I take the wings of the morning, go to the uttermost parts of the sea, you're there. You will know me for the darkness is but light unto you. God's, and David said, he knows my thoughts before I think and my steps before I take them, my words before I say them. See, there's only one God. And he writes that in your heart and you realize and you start laughing. There is no other God. See, Muhammad is mixed up. Confucius is confused. Buddha's bewildered. Jesus is Lord. See, Jesus is, come on, help me preach. Jesus is Lord. Oh, it's written in my heart. You will have no other gods before me. And now the law is not a demand on me. It's a supply coming out. It's a supply. God say, you'll have no other gods. You'll have no other gods. I'm your God. I'm your God. I'm your God. I'm your life. I'm your strength. I'm your joy. I uphold you. You're mine. I bought you. I pay for you. I am your God. And see, when he starts writing that in your heart, then you start coming out of being spoiled. You can start coming out of being prey. You start coming out of the prison houses. You start coming out of the holes and the snare of the fowler. Because, hey, if he's my God, ain't no need me sitting here. Ain't no need me sitting here under all this condemnation, all this guilt, all this shame, all this hell I've been in. Hey, he's my God. And he made a way through Jesus. And I can walk out of this and through this and by this. I can come out to his glory. I've got a God. He's not just up there. He's not just my friend. He ain't just my homeboy. He's my God. He's God. He's God enough. He's God all by himself. Yeah. He's God anytime because he's God every time. He's God anywhere because he's God everywhere. We used to sing in the church of God, he's God up on the platform. I wish I had Thomas Sloan here. I'd give him the mic. Sing it, Thomas. Thomas, to get up there and, you know, Thomas can sing about as good as anybody. Thomas would start singing that and moan a little bit. He'd say, he's God up on the platform. He's God back at the door. He's God in the amen corner. He's God all over the floor. He's God. He's just God. He's God. And he always will be God. He's God when the lightning flashes and God when the thunder rolls. He's God way up in heaven, but he's God down in my soul. See, I got a, I got a word written on my heart that said, I am your God. You'll have no other gods. You don't need another God. I'm all the God you'll ever need. I am God. Wow. Oh, praise God. It's all the God. And, and when you get that in your heart, you start laughing at all these other gods. You just laugh at them because they ain't gods. They want to be gods. They want to be God. But remember, to be God, you got to be omniscient. You got to be omnipotent. And you got to be omnipresent. And if you can't produce that, you ain't God. That means you ain't God. I ain't God. If you can't produce that... <laughs> Some of us have a hard time being here, much less everywhere at the same time. I'm preaching on Sunday morning. I got some people already at the restaurant. They ain't even where they are. They're gone, man. <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> wow. Let's take another. Another. Oh, write this in my heart, Lord. Write this in my heart, Lord. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Write it in my heart. Write it in my heart, Lord. 
Now, in the old covenant, to take the name of the Lord God in vain was to curse or to cuss him or to curse him. We would say cuss, curse him, to speak against his name. He would say to the prophets in Jeremiah's day, you have not spoken right concerning me. He would say to Job's comforters, you've not spoken right concerning me. That's the taking of his name in vain. Old covenant. In the new covenant, you got married to Christ. Romans 7, 4. Now, beloved, you're dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another. You're dead to the law over your head and in your hands. You're dead to the law that you should be married to another, even him who's raised from the dead. So when you get married, you, the woman takes the name of the man. Now, I, Teresa and I got married young, 20 and 17. And uh, we got married on a Saturday. And the next Saturday, I said, all right, now tomorrow, Friday night, I said, we're, we're going to load up everything we got. And you know, when you're, when you're 20 and 17, don't take long. Don't take long. One little blue suitcase has got everything in it with room to spare. We're going to load up everything we got, put what few clothes we got, and we're going to Hillsville, Virginia. We're going to start a revival on Sunday morning. And so we drove from Roanoke to Hillsville, Virginia on Sunday morning. The pastors were young, and they embraced Teresa, and they were glad that we were there, and we were sitting around just talking about the goodness of God as kids. And the next morning when we got through service, I'd preach. We had two people get saved. Thank God two people came and got saved. Thank God for that. And uh, the pastor said, all right, let's stand together. We'll be back tonight at 6 o'clock. We're going to revival every night this week. We're going from Sunday to Sunday. And we want to invite people to come and did what a pastor would do. And he said, Sister Cahill, go ahead and dismiss the service. And she just stood there. She stood there. And he said, Sister Cahill, dismiss the service in prayer. She just stood there. Because, see, in her mind, Sister Cahill's my mama. No, I'm Teresa. <laughs> Sister Cahill's in Rono. She can't dismiss this in prayer. See, she, she has no concept that she now bears my name. I'm, I'm, she stood there. And the third time I punched her and said, he's talking about you. She said, I, not me. I said, pray. <laughs> you see, in the old covenant, to take his name was to curse his name. In the new covenant, to take his name is to, in vain is to not use it for his glory. In my name, these things you command. See, in the old covenant, taking his name in vain was cursing. In the new covenant, if I have his name, and I won't use it to pray for the sick. I won't use it to cast out devils. I won't use it to bring people to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm carrying his, I'm taking, I have married him in vain. He gave me his name. Beloved, you have his name. So let's stop a moment and say, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. God hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things heaven, earth, and under the earth. You have his name. So he writes all these revelations about his name in your heart. I'm Jehovah Jireh and Nisi and Sidkenu and Shaman, Rea, Shalom, Raphael, Shaddai, and all that's in one name. See, you may never study all that. You may not look through Hebrew like I do and like I have and like I have up to this point. But if you say Jesus, you said it all. All you got to do is say Jesus. That's it. That's all. Every name is in that name. He, God put his own name in the name of Jesus. And you know what? You know what Peter says in Acts 3.16? Peter says, now through faith in his name is this man made strong that you see and know. Yea, by the faith of him does this man have this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And then Peter says again in Acts 4, 12, neither salvation in any other. There's one name and it was given, beloved. Not, no, not one name with hell, but no other name given. Not one name with hell, but no other name given among men. Where was it? See, he went to heaven, but he left his name. He went to heaven, but he left his name. He went to heaven, but he left his name. Everything that's done has to be done in his name. Whatsoever you do and word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give me thanks to God and the Father by Him. One more. Well, let's do two real quick. See, just quick. And you know, the, the, each one of these will be a long series of studies of God writing the law in your heart. How about this one? Thou shalt not steal. That's a commandment. Thou shalt not steal. So, Lord, write that in my heart. Now, when He puts that there, thou shalt not steal. And then under that, he said, here's the reason you don't steal is because I'm your source. I'm your supply. You have no lack. You are complete in Christ. I'm your supply. I'm your, remember, rich reward. I'm your salary. And so he starts teaching you what's yours. And see, so, and by the way, you know, God couldn't be a thief because everything's his already. You can't steal what's yours. Now, that, that's impossible. Somebody said, God 
took. No, God didn't take nothing because everything's his. You can't take what's yours. Oh, we got some silly ideas in church. A thief, a thief can only take what's not his. Yeah. If I had more time, I'd talk to you about coming as a thief in the night. He comes as a thief to take what's not his. You see, a thief coming in the night is not coming to take what's his. A thief comes to take what's not his. The night speaks of darkness, and he comes in the darkness, and he takes what's not his. You see, fear is not his. Sickness is not his. Weakness. Mm. It's not his. He comes as a thief in the night. The darkness, he comes in the darkness to take only what's not his. A thief can only take what is not. There's powerful revelation. See, he taught me that by writing his law in my heart. So instead of then taking from you, he says, give. And he writes on my heart this message of giving. I'm a giver, not a taker. I'm not the taker, I'm the giver. Why? He's not the taker, he's the giver. So he starts writing in my heart. You know, some people don't sit in church and got cirrhosis of the liver, man, and the giver. They got cirrhosis of the giver, man. And he says, give and it shall be given. So my desire is to give to you. When I come to this healing school, I'm here to give, not receive. I come in the door to give. I'm here to give. But what happens when you give, you receive. See, he's written it in my heart. I'm not here to steal anything from you. I'm here to give something to you. I'm here to bless you, here to help you. I'm a giver. See, because it's written on my heart, thou shalt not steal. That just don't mean that I'm delivered from being a kleptomaniac. How about this one? Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Hmm. No. In, in Joshua chapter 10, it's recorded. This is a powerful word, Joshua chapter 10. He says, and when they return to Machpelah, which means the place of the shepherds, to Joshua and Machpelah, he said, none moved his tongue against any in Israel. None moved his tongue. If I can move my tongue against you, I can move my tongue for you. Listen to that in Joshua chapter 10. And none moved his tongue against any. If I move my tongue, I'm going to move my tongue for you. I'm not going to bear false witness against you. I am going to bring testimony for you. I'm going to testify that you're the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm going to testify that by his stripes you're healed. I'm going to testify that you're anointed, appointed, ordained in this generation to bring forth fruit in the kingdom of God. I'm going to testify that you're the blessed seed of Abraham. You're healed and free, filled and full. Your foundation sure Jesus is Lord. I'm going to move my tongue for you, not against you. And see, he writes his law in my heart. It's not my desire to bear false anything. I want to be a manifestation of the truth, not that which is false. Paul says you commend you to God and you commend yourself to every man's conscience in the sight of God by being a manifestation of the truth. So the law is written in our heart. So just simply said, summing up this morning, what God wants to do is write his law in our heart. And there's so many people that have missed this. And, and truthfully, what grace has done, it's got law from over our head. It's got it out of our hands. But unless this happens, the grace people and all the people that have gone that way are going to go right to Isaiah 40, 20, 42, 22, and they'll be robbed. They'll be snared. And they'll be in holes. Just a word of warning. It's a word of caution. Because the word of grace is part of the table. The word of faith is part of the table. The word of reconciliation. The word of truth. The word of life. The word of Christ. The word of his power. The word of his rest. The word of the oath. The word of exhortation. The word of patience. All of those have their place. Can I have a good amen? So God writes your law in my heart today. He's well pleased for his righteousness. He's made the law honorable now, you know, and, and the law in, over the head and the hands, you know where the law that way belongs? It belongs in the White House. It's for the ungodly. It's for the unholy. It belongs in the White House, the State House, the Courthouse, the Jail House, the School House. And it belongs in the Church House in its rightful place, but the law is not to be hanging on the wall, it's to be written in our heart. And it becomes a prophetic utterance. See, now he's not demanding that I not steal. He's prophesying to me that I won't have to steal because everything I need is supplied. Everything I need is manifested. Everything I need flows freely. He's telling me I don't have to talk against somebody because God's talking for me. I can talk for somebody instead of against somebody now. In the name of Jesus. All right, that's long enough. Stand up. Stand with me. If you ain't got something by now, you probably ain't going to get it today here. You're going to have to go home and study. Pray yourself in Jesus' name.